Hey, this is Edwin Dearborn, another edition of Growth Driven, and today I'm with Bobby Newman, and we're going to be talking about family intervention, helping people with drugs, and kind of going over what his business model is, how he's reaching out to people, and changing people's lives. Hey, Bobby, how you doing? Hi, I'm good. Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So, Bobby, um, man, what a tough business model, but yet rewarding, obviously. Uh, drug interventions, helping families to get people off of drug, alcohol, opioid abuse. I mean, it's so much in the news, and you're out there doing the good work out there. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely tough. How did you get, uh, how did you, your own personal story, get started in this line of work? Well, I had to go through rehab uh, 20 years ago. It was actually, uh, I graduated uh, December 19th of 2000 of the program that I was into. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to go out and educate kids about the effects of drugs and what it takes to get overcome addiction. You know, there's a lot of prevention programs out there, but they never really talk to kids about how you become addicted. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I got into it doing drug prevention. And uh, then it just kind of led into other things through my, um, you know, uh, experience and the opportunities presented itself. I, I started a drug education program in Oklahoma, and then I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii. And uh, I set up a drug ed program out there Then it kind of evolved into doing other things. And then I got to doing interventions and happened to have a knack for that. And so it just kind of one thing led to another. So. Okay, great. So you've been doing drug intervention now for 20 years. Yes, it, pretty much. I mean, you know, I started at probably at least 18, 18, 19 years. I think the first actual intervention I did was in 2001. So, okay. Yeah. So, so, so tell me what, tell me your definition of intervention and what does a, a typical, I know it's probably nothing typical in what you do, but if we were to take kind of a a general sense of what an intervention is, take us through how that rolls forward. An intervention is basically the act of intervening or stopping something and coming in between. And it's generally, um, you know, a fo stopping the destructive behavior and the, the destructive action. And, you know, there's a lot of interventions out there that we have, but we have no control over those things. We have jail, we have loss of job, we have loss of money, we have loss of, you know, just uh, all these losses that, you know, it's the environment trying to stop us. Overdoses, health problems, just a host of these things. We have no control over those things and uh, there's no explanation. So this is a way of, and a lot of times with me as, our, you know, when I get involved as the family's been contributing to this addiction for 15, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't know how to stop it. And they, you know, the, the, the motherly instincts come into play and, and uh, or the fatherly instincts or what, you know, the, the uh, humanitarian, I should say, instincts come into play about, well, I need to help this person. Well, the truth is, is you're doing all the wrong things to help. Usually the person, the family is doing all the wrong things. And so we, it, it, the act of intervening is to come together it, to stop the destructive behavior and do things that are going to be productive to help, you know, it, get the person back on the path to, to living a successful life. So that's great. Yeah. You bring up a good point, which is it's not just helping the individual intervene with the individual that has the drug or alcohol problem. It's really intervening with a family who's enabling. That's true. Yes. The problem. Yeah. 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 And sometimes we actually have to have those of us in this industry that we, we do an intervention on the enabler first <laughs> yeah and then we do the intervention on the addict and you know because that whole thing dynamic has to change or the likelihood we're going to be have success even if we do get the person to treatment or when we do get the person to treatment and they complete the program um if everybody goes back to doing the same things they've always done guess what who else is going to go back to doing the same things they've always done so never, never thought of it that you've got you not only have the drug a addict you've got the support system that keeps him addicted to drugs whether that's family friends community whatever or all of the above he, there's obviously a system in place to to a greater or lesser degree that's actually empowering 
that individual to stay addicted to drugs and alcohol. Yes. Um, so I don't know what. It, I hope my screen didn't mess up there. I apologize, but no, uh, no you're fine. You're fine. Just close out the, the other uh, window. The huh? Just close out the other windows. Yeah. I don't know why that happened, but anyway, sorry about that. The um, you know that's that's just it. I mean, even the same goes for the, again. We go back to cliches or whatever, but every ad, every fire needs oxygen. Every addict needs an enabler. There's some sort of you know, whether it be there's somebody in agreement with this person for this destructive paper and contributing to it. And we always we're always looking for that. We first, you know, when I first go in and start talking to the family within ten minutes, I'm going to know who the enabler is. And sometimes the family, like I just got off the phone with a mother up in uh, up in New York. Uh, you know, I'm the enabler, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> at least we've yeah. identified that right off the bat. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that I think that's key. And I, you know, when you bring that up, I don't think that that's appreciated enough or well known enough. It's like we always want to go after the person that has the problem, and rightfully so. Right. I think a lot of people have the right. Uh, the right sentiment in their heart, the right mindset going, Hey, let's help the guy that's having the problem. Right. But if you're new to the problem, you probably don't see the hidden forces right. that are behind the problem. Right. It, it, yeah. And that's, that's it. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's always a fundamental reason why the, the addiction even started and then exacerbated to the point that it is by the time I get involved. It's like there's the fuel feeding that fire. And, you know, I have to explain it to people a lot of times with, you know, I've had to explain it to people like, okay, so if you don't stop giving him money and you don't stop washing his clothes and feeding him and giving him, you know, all these things to support his habit then he's going to get worse. You realize that, right? Yes, I do realize that. Okay, so you need to stop doing those things. So can you stop doing them? I don't think I can. Well, why can't you stop doing those things? Well, because I'll feel so bad. I'll feel so guilty. And I said, all right, well, let's take a look at that. And these are actual conversations that I have almost 100% of the time. Um, and the, I'll say, so let's take a look at that. So what you're actually saying is that you're not doing it you're not stopping your behavior for his benefit. You're st not stopping your behavior for your own benefit, hmm. you know, your own guilt or your own misdeeds or things that you've done, or maybe you did something years ago that you feel bad about now. And, you know, that's not doing us any good. We have to live in the now and actually handle it. So, I, and some people just can't, they just cannot uh, bring themselves to be able to do it. I, I've had people, you know, um, you know, I was down in Florida recently and, and the mother just started following, you know, the guy was a little bit, you know, he was, he, he ended up going, but it was like a little bit, you know, in the beginning, it, it kind of gets a little noisy. And, um, and I had to kind of scold her. I said, look, this is not the time to be losing it. You need to hold it together. This is the, he's depending on you to be strong. You know, I mean, it, if you looked at this, like a guy who jumped out the, the, the light, the, the, the boat of life and everybody's in the, in the boat. And then you have the guy jump out. Well, the last thing he needs, he needs to you to help him get back in the boat, not freak out and cry. And which, you know, it's understandable why people do that. But at the yeah. same time, that's not helping us. We need to be strong. And so we, we I try to prepare the family. Preparation is a key. And, and you know, the girl that works for me, She'll tell you, you know, she actually is the one that got me into rehab 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, so we've been working together that long. But she'll tell you that the intervention is 80 percent for the family and 20 percent for the addict. Wow. And people, I, Go ahead. That makes a lot of sense to me, you know, and, and I think that's a part of the problem that I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate or talk about. You know, if, when you watch reality TV or you listen to government PR programs about how we're going to help addiction. It, it's yeah. almost, and, and again, I, I don't think anybody's got evil, evil intentions when they talk about it, but all the attention is on the drug addict versus the ecosystem that created it, supports it, enables it. And the moment you dismantle that apparatus there's nothing to support the drug addict. And now he can go back into an environment once he's rehabbed that doesn't 
plug them back into the matrix. If you that's will. right, that's right, and you know that that falls in line with uh, another uh, you know com- thing that it's like if you you know you, this whole thing's got to change. If you don't change your ways, mm-hmm. he's not going to change his ways. He goes right back. Everybody can go. It's called it. The term is called familial homeostasis. Homeostasis means the desire to stay the same. The family wants to stay the same. So within that family system. Uh, you know, everybody kind of, you know, they're all used to having this problem and they're used to dealing with this problem. They're used to, you know, having it kind of becomes a routine for them. So any change in that um, is is a big deal. It's hard for people to break that. It's that whole dynamic of the way it always interacts. This is the way it's always been. So people don't realize And I mean, I, even my family who, uh, you know, fell victim of that or not victim. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but, you know, they kind of had to like when I got out of rehab and it's not their fault. It's that it's that they just kind of did things. And later on thought, well, wait a minute, that wasn't very smart. <laughs> My sister took me to a Christmas party once and uh, right after I got out of rehab and it was, uh, you know, a nice steakhouse with an open bar, you know, it was a company Christmas party. So it was all, you know, I could have went in there and did anything. I <laughs> had drinks galore. And I, she didn't even think about it. She thought the next day, she said, well, that wasn't very smart. And I, I, I was done with it. I didn't, you know, but still it, it was just a, afterthought that we thought about that particular thing could have maybe led to, you know, going back down the same path again. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just joining in, I'm with uh, Bobby Newman with Newman Interventions. You can visit him, newmaninterventions.com, find out about his services. Also, if you're listening to this later on as a podcast and you can't see it uh, below, I have uh, on my screen here, newmaninterventions.com. So, Bobby, it's interesting this this homeostasis phenomenon. Um, like so so little people talk about it now in the business world. They call it nepotism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the parallel, <laughs> right? You've got your you've got your son working at your business. He's lazy, shows up late, yet he's making big payroll, telling everybody what to do. He doesn't know what he's doing. Everybody resents the heck out of the kid. Yeah. Yeah. Because dad got him the job. Uh, yeah. They motivate off of it too. Yeah, they do. They motivate off of like things that, you know, maybe not doing as good a job or, you know, sneaking things out the back door or, you yeah. know, what, whatever. So yeah, you get like a Biden hunter. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, like <laughs> Biden hunter on his own would have never had any political power or clout, but because of uh, Joe yeah. uh, Hunter has got all this, access to to basically free money that's nepotism right right so on a on a drug addiction level you this homeostasis phenomenon is part of the whole um structure that that keeps the addiction going is there do you have like formal training to prepare the family to kind of go okay you've got homeostasis Mm-hmm. And here's how we're going to deal with it. Like how, tell me how you address that with the family. I, I don't necessarily use that term. I mean, I, uh, with, with, cause I want to be able to speak with a lot of people. True. On their level. But I mean, the idea is the same. What you're saying is yeah. definitely, it, it kind of sums it all up into one little nutshell. And I do have a course on, you know, cause the better added that I can, pre- the better I can prepare the family, it actually makes my job easier. You know, and yeah. I, so I have an intervention course that I have people do. And, um, you know, basically I had a guide that was 38 pages or 40, maybe it was 44 pages long. I think it's 38 pages of text. It's got, anyway, I could never could get anybody to read it. And then I shortened it up to 25 tips to successful intervention. And I, I review that before I go over, you know, before we actually do the intervention. But this course, I kind of summed it all up and, and put everything in there that, um, you know, a person is going to need to know. And I, it's a, it's about an hour and 50 minutes. It's broken up into 12 different video, little short videos. Nice. And it's designed to, to educate the family. So. Okay, good. All right. So you've got the educational materials available yeah. to help the families. Okay. It Now here we are 2021. Um, you've been in it for about 20 years. What is the biggest drug or alcohol crisis that we have in America today? Well, I mean, honestly, it's across the board. It's it remains, uh, you know, all very, you know, alcohol, heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine. You know, methamphetamine was making a comeback. And, you know, I just saw an article in the in the, uh, that came across my uh, 
headlines today on my computer that talked about the opioid epidemic is uh, making, you know, it's, it's, you know, people, you know, and uh, those of us in the treatment industry, we talk about this pandemic within the pandemic because, you know, when it first started, the pandemic first started and the shutdowns and everything, it was a big, people, I actually, I had a, a facility that I work with in, uh, in Louisiana that uh, they said, oh, yeah, well, people are coming in because their, their drug supply is starting to run out. It was affecting the whole shipment process and shutting everything down. And, uh, and everybody was like, holy crap, I've got to get into treatment. And so they were then, then that all changed. And it, but then people started getting worse because they didn't have access to treatment or, you know, so there's uh, anyway. It, so there's it's still across the board. But I would have to say that. Uh, you know, opioids and uh, are still a significant problem. And then, you know, another thing to, to, with the legalization of marijuana, we're seeing more and more people that are literally like going psychotic. They're going psychotic, and uh, uh, the you know, well, and now all they're testing positive for is, is marijuana. And I don't know whether it, the synthetics are laced in there or the chemicals that are on the marijuana, but these guys are going you know, and not, not able to recover. And this is, it's happening more and more frequently in the last two to three years than it ever has in the last 20. So, wow. so marijuana, while legal, it still has devastating effects. And I think you bring up a good point. I think there's a combination of things. This is my personal opinion uh -huh. about marijuana. Um, and I'm not going to get into the legal or illegal or is it medicinal or not. I'm, I don't want to have that conversation. Yeah. But I think what has happened is the reason why marijuana is so addictive is, number one, yes, there are more chemicals that we're spraying on all of our foods. Right. Plants, just generally. Yes. That's true of corn, apples, marijuana. Yeah. Number two, I think you've got organizations, whether it's DuPont or a DuPont-esque type company that has come in and modified the organic version of marijuana that maybe our forefathers had 300 years ago yeah. that they were making rope out of yeah. and they've genetically modified it where now the THC level is 25, 30 times stronger than what mother nature intended it to be. Yeah. <laughs> and that, then, you've also got, you probably may be aware of this is that there are, actually cooking down the you know these plants and pulling it out called uh, oh i forget it's like an oil and they pull this oil yeah. out of it it's like 95 percent or even maybe 100 percent pure thc right and so that that's another factor you know and, and i have a friend of mine just to touch on that i i i you know you can't deny that there may be some medicinal benefits or there are some medicinal benefits sure. to, sure. to marijuana the marijuana plant Right. It's not that, you know, and, and it could be used for anti seizures. And, but I mean, I talk to kids and I say, look, man, you know, you guys can say whatever you want to. I used to smoke weed. I used to be an advocate for smoking weed. And I had all those things. I had a lot of really cute sayings that uh, <laughs> but if you're smoking anything, you're not really doing it for the medicinal benefits. You're doing it to get high. And I, right. you know, and, and I, I can't say that people that have pain or, where you know it comes down to uh, like you're saying, I, I'm not going to get into the argument of, of uh, you know whether it's not medicinally beneficial because the cannabinoids can be, they definitely can, can be, and, sure. and I know people that kids are having seizures and things like that that it could be helpful for. So, but the, but the guys that like you're talking about though, they don't want you to know that. <laughs> they want oh, it's all good. So you know it's all money driven. So it's not for your best interest. So absolutely, look, it's a business and. They want to, you know, they they want to grow their market base, mm -hmm. and so they're going to use propaganda and PR and marketing tactics yeah. to get people to believe what they want them to believe, so as to grow in their sales. It's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then it comes down to you know anything across if people. I just ask the people do their own research and be smart about it, and you know, and and understand that anything that. Sounds too good to be true. Probably is, and you know, uh, if it's a chemical, if it involves chemicals, it's um, more than likely is going to have a well, it, not more than likely it does have a side effect. So it may have the desired effect, but uh, there are going to be side effects as well. So yeah, very true. Um, and as I told one person, those side effects are direct effects because you wouldn't be having the side effect yeah. if you didn't take the drug. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. right. That's true. That's true. It's a direct effect. It's a direct effect. There's no yeah. side of it. It isn't like, no, that's a direct, that's directly affected by it. So now, okay. How do you, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously we know about places like the Betty Ford center, you know, because celebrities go there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's probably some other places. How do you go out and build awareness Obviously, the awareness is there that we need intervention. Well, people, how do you build awareness for you and get people to come to you? Well, I have a, my website. Uh, you know, I do shows. Like, thankfully, I have people such as yourself that are you know gracious enough to have me on. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then I do. Uh, you know, I have a website that you know people go to newmaninterventions.com and there's a presence there. So uh, I don't. Anyway, I, I don't know if that came across your screen or not, but I apologize. No worries. We'll just keep rolling. Okay. Um, the um, Yeah, so, the, you know, my website, I do radio shows. I do community outreach and things of that nature. Uh, as far as me, you know, I hope I'm answering your question effectively. You are. Absolutely. But, um, so yeah, and I and I it, network with people. I do, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm members on Facebook or social media, you know, uh, outlets. And matter of fact, I was just chatting with a guy today that came across, you know, he ran across my website on a, on one of the groups, uh, you know, Facebook groups that he's in, a member of, and he kind of asked, was asking questions about, you know, what I do and what approaches I use and what, you know, at, what I advocate for, and you know, he's kind of checking me out, and and he'd been, you know, he'd been uh, clean like I don't know three years or three, 1,465 days or something like that. <laughs> so he was pretty proud of that fact that he should be. So yeah. anyway. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, so you're, gonna, you're using social media podcasts and getting interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. What, what do you find are the most common questions that people have? Let's say the top three questions you get and what are your answers to those questions? Top three questions are, I don't know if he's addicted or not. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what drugs he's using. Okay. Okay. And my answer is, you know, and there's, um, uh, or, you know, what, what, what you know, should, am I doing, you know, one thing, one question is, is, am I doing the right thing? Hmm. Right. Okay. So, and I would always say, look, you know, the truth is, while it is important to know what drugs are being abused, if you just took the drugs away, let's just say we had no evidence of any drugs, how is he doing in life? How is he acting, you know? Is he showing up to work every day? Is he, you know, is he stable? Is he making good sound decisions? Is he, you know, and they'll always say no. And, you know, usually there's a whole list of problems. Okay, good. So he needs help in life. He doesn't, you know, so let's take, we can take that argument away because I hear all the time, well, I'm not addicted to drugs. I go, okay, let's, I don't even argue with them about it anymore. I'll say, okay, well, all right, that's one less thing. Then. <laughs> but how, yeah. how, yeah. How, how are you doing in life? And they'll say, oh, well, it sucks. I said, okay, so how can we help you? with?" And then, then I work out from there. But um, And so that's the question for, I don't know exactly, you know, I haven't actually caught him. Well, the truth is, is there's all this other signs and symptoms of, of him not yeah. doing well. And so, and then um, and my my answer to people, if am I doing the right thing or not? I always tell them, look, I, you can never overreact on something like this. You can always underreact. Good you know, point. Good you point. Know, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, even my son, who's 29 and doing great now, selling life insurance in Miami, living the single life, driving a sports car around in Miami, you know, um, he um, when he was 14, 15 years old, he started going down that path. I had no evidence of him using drugs at all, but I just knew he was making some bad decisions that was not, and it was not going to end well. So I, we decided to intervene on him, and you know, we got him squared away, got him in a position where he could figure out the rest of his life and what he wanted to do with it, and. Um, so anyway, that's my thing is you can never overreact. You always, people always want to underreact. Oh, I just want to do a little bit. And, and then, and then people fail. They never give themselves a chance to succeed. So they fail and then they try it again a little bit more and then they fail again. And so then after a while, they, oh, the treatment doesn't work. Well, you never really had a chance anyway. So, yeah, it, it, I mean, you can't care too much. There's no much, there's no much yeah. you know, I loved my, 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 my kids too much. No, you, there's a, that doesn't exist. Right. Ex exactly. That's right. right. Great I think, and I think the other thing that you bring to light here, which is very interesting for people, which is 
Let's stop looking at the addiction. Let's look at the bad decisions that the person's making. Mm -hmm. To me, that's more obvious. It's such a great way. I could even see an ad going, you know, what bad decisions are you making these days? Yeah. And almost take the bad decision and then go, by the way, are drugs or alcohol in any way influencing these the decision making? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go bing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, the, the signs are like they started seeing the signs a long time ago. Right. So, right. And then they were like, well, I, you know, I'm not quite sure. And then it gets up to where now the brick wall is coming at us about a thousand miles an hour. And we're like, oh, you know, there's a brick wall up there. Well, the truth is we saw the road signs a long time ago. We just never paid it. We chose to ignore them. And and that's right. It's it, what you said. The way you put it was exactly 100% correct. So. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see um, almost instead of going, "Hey, let's talk about your drug problem." Like, Ugh. It, it, that's hard to confront if you're a drug addict, and you know, and most people will agree that people that have got a serious problem, yeah, that's been going on for a long time, they're in denial. They can't right. confront it. Right. Exactly. That's the thing they can't confront. I have a drug or alcohol problem. No, I don't. Okay. But I think what they are willing to confront is, tell me your last bad decision. <laughs> yeah, that's not like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was was you know? And, um, I had a guy once in um, uh, uh, in Hawaii. I did went over there, and he had, his family owned a car lot, and he went out and stole a car, and went out and, and was drunk and high on Benz, Benz or Xanax, and drove a car into a telephone pole on purpose and you know we, it, go ahead wow I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 about 40 miles an hour and and he says we did the intervention and he looks at me and just you know just said i don't have a drug problem with stuff okay all right well obviously uh, so how's your and i asked him how's your life going he said well it sucks and i said okay well <laughs> what what would you like to help with and he said well, i hate people and i said well I understand. I said, there's a lot of people out there I don't like either, but we can't be driving our, you know, our solution to handling those problems. And and his his question to me was, well, how are you going to help me with that problem? And I said, okay. Yeah. And I, I explained it to him and he became interested at that point. Yeah. You know, that's our, it, it's, it, it's interesting how you have to enter the case. Yeah. 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 Which so is I, their point of reality is not, I have a drug problem. Right. Yeah. I hate people. How are you going to help me with that? <laughs> like, that's a good question. That's a great, that's a great, uh, I think I can help you with the, <laughs> learning some things. Um, I had a girl that, uh, you know, another example was, you know, and, and, and along the same line as I went in there, got the girl, to, well, I told my mother I would go, but I'm not going today. I'm like, okay, well then the natural impulse for the family is to start arguing with her about going today. And I'm like, no, all right, and I finally had to tell him, look, stop saying, stop, you know. And I just agree with her. Okay, good, uh, you'll go. Okay, great. Uh, so you can't go today. So what do we need to do between now and, you know, I guess it was, I think it was on a Friday. We, it was, this was Tuesday or Wednesday, but what do we need to do between now and then? She started li listing these things out. And I said, okay, well, good, let's do, and then, and I'm not joking, like with an hour later, she goes, I guess I could go today. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, good. Let's, I'll book this flight for two hours from now. You know, so it, it's what, all in how you handle, you know, the blow, the pushback, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think, you know, look, um, if the person is a decent person, which I believe most people are, I'm sure there's, you run into some genuinely evil individuals, but yeah. I'm sure that 97% of the people you run into are, you know, they're just good people that made bad decisions yeah, yep. on a routine basis. Drugs and alcohol became a crutch. Yep. Um, and they're, you're, they're looking to solve a problem. So the moment you find a, a point of interest on that, pr the problem they're interested in solving, yeah. then that begins the road to recovery. That That is 100% correct. And, you know, I, as you were saying that, it actually reminded me of something else that we're doing uh, to actually that I'm excited about. We just started it this week is an outreach program to going out and doing Zoom meetings with churches. And we're, we're helping mm. them understand 
the the life cycle and mechanics of addiction and how it starts and it, it starts with the you and it starts with a problem the per, person started making bad decisions back when they were a teenager or whatever or maybe the person had a surgery or an injury or something i started taking pain meds or you know whatever the right. addiction started with a problem and the drugs became a solution to that problem then they then become the problem so Anyway, yeah, I was the other thing that I, we're actually doing uh, doing outreach programs to churches, and we hope to be able to reach, you know, all across the country uh, to different churches and get you know anywhere from twenty to or more people into a Zoom meeting and go over uh, the mechanics of addiction and how it starts. So that's great. That's great. I I, I I think that's a great great way because look, you know, people turn to their churches for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think, you know, obviously they're trying to find some type of relief, a spiritual yeah. answer, a, a holy moment, an epiphany, uh, a, a support group of positive minded people right. that are going to love them. So I think churches are just a perfect outreach point because obviously they're a community that's trying to elevate themselves on higher principles. Yes. Yes. Yes, and yeah, so uh, all of that, <laughs> so, all of what you just said is one hundred percent correct. So yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Hey, so Bobby, I'm gonna just tell them about your website one more time. If you are listening or have viewed this or viewing it in the future, a year from now, six months from now, because it will be up on YouTube, just go to Newman Interventions. I will put a link below in the podcast and in the YouTube video. So if you're watching it, just scroll down you'll see the link there you can click on it and that will direct you uh right to uh bobby's website so bobby before we go what are what are some last tips or instructions or motivation that you'd like to share with us about what you do and why they should i would, do I would encourage everybody that you know and I, it's, it's even like you know you're obviously a business related podcast for businesses and um, you know, an addict, when you have somebody who is making bad decisions or unethical decisions, um, and there's something is not necessarily addressed. And I, I want to I use the word addressed, you know, cause I want, I normally would say confronted, but sometimes people get the idea because you confront something like me confronting you about, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I didn't like what you did. And well, it's, yeah, it's, confrontational. It's, being it's, confrontational. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, really not a good way to do it. You can say, Hey, you know what? I, I, I really got something I want to talk to you about. And I, it's, I you know, and find a way that where you can communicate to the person where they can accept the communication yes. in a safe manner where you can have that talk. So anyway, address the situation productively. But if you, if for an addict, if you let them go, let's say a guy starts showing up late for work. And uh, which is a common thing, you know, for addicts, they, they're undependable, they, you know, have things happen. They, uh, I, so you don't address it. Hey man, I saw that you were late for work today and I just want to bring it to your attention. Let's, let's try to cut that out. And, you know, let's, we need to be here. We'll, you know, if you could show up a little earlier, that would be great. We'll, you know, five, 10 minutes early. Uh, then you brought it to their attention. And then the mm -hmm. second time, hey man, this is the second time that you've shown up late. You know, if it keeps happening, I'm, we're gonna have to. There's gonna be some consequences, right? So please, you know, you do a good job. I like you. I want you, you know, or whatever you might say. Third time, then you got to bring them in and say, okay, look, if you don't want to, you know, there's like the the consequences continually get more stringent, and you know that way they're not it, get the idea that you're in agreement with it. Because if you don't do do that, and you they'll, the, an addict will actually think you're in agreement with it. Oh, he didn't say. I, my, my, I'll give you an example. My oldest sister saw me smoking weed at uh, a, a Hank Williams concert one time years ago, and uh, she never said anything about it. I, she saw me doing it. She just kind of rolled her eyes and went on, and I thought, oh, okay. You know, she, and she's a very devout Christian woman and, and you know, definitely does not agree with smoking weed, but she never really said anything. But in my mind, I was like, oh, you know, she's not doesn't have a problem with it. So I, I just kept doing it. Now, whether, you know, she would have changed my course of action or not, uh, I don't know, but still, I, in my mind, I thought, oh, well, okay, cool. She's not really no big deal. Um, so, yeah, you, you you can't. The point is, is this, and I want to address a couple of things you brought up. Number one is tacit consent is an enabling factor. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Number two, you brought up this is a business show. Yes, it is. But I'm going to tell you something. There are business people out there that have drug and alcohol problems. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
So this is very relative. If it's a factor in your production or lack thereof, then Bobby Newman may be somebody you want to reach out to. And number two, maybe you're not, maybe you're at work and you're not the one with drug or alcohol right. problem, but you've got a guy that you care about. He's been um, one of your best employees. Right. And he went through a divorce or lost a child or whatever, had the surgery. And now he's got the drug or alcohol problem. Again, being a responsible business owner, you've got to kind of take care of your flock. That is 100% correct. That, and that's a great way to put it. Um, yep. And how, what was the term you used? Tacit? Tacit consent. Tacit consent. I'm going to I'm gonna use that. <laughs> yeah. Tacit <laughs> consent is an enabler. I yeah. mean, yeah. like you said, you know, well, I think they're okay with it. So I guess I'm okay with it. Right, right, right. right. You know, the, the person is only, if you don't stop the behavior, it's only going to keep working, you know, it's only going to get worse. It's, you know, nothing ever stays the same. Oh, well, he'll stop, you know, well, you know, he's not, you know, the likelihood you got to, you've got to intervene. That's it. That, and that is a form of intervention right there. Just bring it to their attention that you noticed. You know, yeah. So, yeah, that's the first step is, you know, noticing and saying something about it. Right. Well, Hey, Bobby, it's been great having you on Growth Driven. I think you've added a ton of value and a ton of insight here to our community. And hopefully in the future, a lot of people will find this video and the podcast, reach out to you as a result of this, and, and we'll change some lives together because of it. So thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for the work that you're going to continue to do because uh, it's so needed in our society. If you are... Um, a viewer of Growth Driven, or you're listening to Growth Driven here on a podcast, I want to thank you for being a part of your, our community because, I look, time is precious. So anytime you spend with us to listen to my podcast, to watch our show, it is greatly appreciated. I do this for one purpose, and that is to serve you, to help you, whether it's in business, overcome drug addiction, uh, inspire you, encourage you, change your mindset, give you better strategy, whatever we're talking about. It is a uh, purpose-driven uh, effort that we do here to add value to your life. So once again, Bobby, thank you so much for being part of our community. And, uh, and to all of you that are watching or listening, thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you.